Hi everyone. Um, so I hope you don't mind me recording this mini lecture in bed. It is absolutely freezing today, so I'm wearing a hat indoors and a big old hoodie. Um, but I wanted to make good on my promise to uh, finish uh, with the last few slides on Milgram. I'm hoping this lecture is only going to be uh, very short, so that you can just watch it briefly and, and catch up. So let's get started. Before we start talking about Milgram, we need to understand why he was inspired to conduct his obedience research. Now history is filled with evidence of obedience. All we need to do is look at the wars that have happened historically and are still happening now to see that people, well armies in their hundreds will be obedient to unjust commands that hopefully go against their conscience just um, in the name of being obedient. This means that over history, millions of people have been involved in horrific acts, but all of those people don't necessarily have sadistic tendencies. Only a few of them, actually, maybe thousands or hundreds of thousands, would actually have um, sadistic tendencies. So how do we explain the horrific behaviour of the other millions and millions of soldiers over the history of war. Why do normal people perform inhumane acts just to be obedient? An example we'll talk about today is Adolf Eichmann. He was a notorious Nazi soldier who was guilty of committing horrible atrocities during the Second World War. The frightening thing about him was that he was reported as being quiet and unassuming, a really nice guy. So why did he commit such horrific acts? Because, in his words, he was just following orders. Well, Milgram wanted to understand this. Like many researchers, he was terrified of the Holocaust and he wanted to understand why normal, civilised people obey orders that counteract what we hope are their core values. So, he advertised for men to take part in a study this study, according to the participants that applied for it, was about teaching and learning, and participants would be paid £4 for the work that they would be doing for approximately one hour. Participants arrived at the lab at the same time as one other person, and an experimenter randomly told them that one was a, per that one was a teacher and the other person was a learner. The teacher and the learner were then placed in separate rooms and connected via an intercom. The teacher was instructed to deliver electric shocks every time the learner made a mistake on their word recall task. What the teachers didn't know is that they weren't randomly assigned to their group at all. All participants were assigned to the group of teacher and the learner was a confederate. They were only pretending to be a participant, but actually they knew that it was a hoax all along. During the study, the teacher asked the learner questions, and every time the learner made a mistake, they were given an electric shock. Each mistake made increased the voltage of the electric shock, so over the study they were shocked up to 450 volts. Of course, the learner wasn't getting shocked, but they were acting like they were receiving electric shocks, and they were given a list of predetermined objections to the electric shocks. At 90 volts, they said, uh, at 150 volts, they said, get me out of here, my heart's starting to bother me. And at 345 volts, they stopped responding. If the teacher objected to electrocuting someone almost to death, then the experimenter, who was stood in the room with the teacher, had a series of prompts that they need to use in a specific order. The first was please continue, and they got slowly more intense until the fourth prompt, you have no other choice, you must go on. Before the study ran, Milgram asked psychiatrists what they thought the participants would do. Did they think that the participants would 
just because they were asked to by an experimenter shock another person to what they can only assume is death. And psychiatrists said that only 1% would go to the end. And when they said that, they meant the proportion of mentally ill and particularly psychopathic people in the population. Similar estimates were made worldwide by from clinicians, academics and also members of the public. And Milgram only had 40 participants. So, theoretically, there was only a small likelihood that even one of them would go to 150 volts, according to the psychiatrist's predictions. But all participants shocked the learner up to 300 volts. And if you remember, at 150 volts, the learner started to express that they were worried about their heart. And at 375 volts or 345 volts, the learner stops responding completely. So five people, the first five people to stop shocking the Confederate still gave them an extreme shock that they knew could have killed them. But 26 of the original 40 participants went to 450 volts. This is significantly later than the participant, than the, sorry, than the learner had stopped responding. So as far as the participant knew, the learner may well be dead. This became the experiment that shocked the world. <laughs> Milgram said, this is perhaps the most fundamental lesson of our study, that ordinary people simply doing their jobs can become agents of a terribly destructive process. Essentially, Milgram had demonstrated how so many millions of people had behaved in sadistic and torturous ways when they theoretically only 1% of them should have done it. So Milgram is explaining obedience to authority resulting in genocide. Now, this is a really difficult thing to accept. I would really like to believe that um, I wouldn't be manipulated into committing genocide. But according to obedience research, or at least early obedience research, that is what most people would do. There have been a significant amount of replications of Milgram's study by Milgram himself and others, and they have found different levels of obedience. Um, at, so it's not always 100% of participants uh, willing to hurt another person, but they do have some quite scary results still. The explanation for this result is that human beings enter what we call an agentic state. We stop behaving as ourselves, as individuals, and we cede responsibility to an authority. We become an agent of authority. And this agentic state results in something called the banality of evil. The fact that evil can be present in even the most typical person, even the most boring man. However, Berger et al. in 2011 question the interpretation of these results. They said that Milgram's study of uh, obedience actually proves the opposite of what Milgram concluded. It proves that humans will disobey a command. When you, the prompts are please continue or please go on, the experimenter is trying to get the uh, teacher to conform to them, trying to um, request that they continue, so change their internal attitude. When the experimenter wants them to comply, so they say the experiment requires that you continue, so they're taking uh, away the need for their attitude to be positive, all they want is complying, um, then people are more likely to disobey. And actually, when they're given an order, so you have no choice, you must go on, so they're not expecting, uh, so they're directly expecting obedience. That's actually when the participants are most likely to disobey. So really, Milgram's study shows that people do disobey 
uh, people in authority if they choose to, which actually is a bit of a scarier thought. But if it's not about following orders, then what is it about? Why do people um, why do people obey uh, commands in these situations? Well, the social identity theory of influence can explain this possibly a little bit better than Milgram. According to social identity theory, we're more likely to obey people if we identify with them. We are more influenced by people that we identify with. So, if we identify with a group that they represent, perhaps that they are a prototypical group member of, and we therefore um, we therefore might feel more influenced by them, and therefore are more likely to follow their instructions or to obey the commands to harm people from the out group because the command is coming from a member of their in group. In fact, you'll find in replications of Milgram's work, um, including replications by Milgram himself. When you manipulate who the teacher identifies with, this has an impact in the levels of obedience in that study. So, if you manipulate the teacher, so the participant, into identifying as an in-group with the experimenter, they're more likely to obey commands. But, if you manipulate them so that they feel that they are in an in-group with the victim, they're more likely to disobey commands. So they might increase identification with the experimenter by um, saying that they went to the same university, or they might increase identification with the victim by giving them the opportunity um, to talk before the, uh, before the study and form some sort of um, relationship. In Milgram's original design, there was a lot about the methodology that bound the participant to the experimenter, so that brought them closer in their social identity, so supporting the social identity theory of obedience and influence. They made the researchers seem like they were in a high status group by playing up the importance of the research and highlighted the uh, impact that the participant could have on the research, so then be part of this. Uh, high status group. Milgram himself presented as the prototypical scientist and everything looked very official. So in the original design it made sense that the teacher would feel more in an in-group with the experimenter than with the learner. As I said, Milgram conducted quite a few variations of his study and obedience ranged from 0 to 100%. When they looked at the, uh, when they explored the social context impact on obedience, they found that people were more likely to be obedient in a high uh, esteem university like Yale than if the study was being run in a rundown part of town. They also found that teachers were less likely to be obedient if they were in the same room as the learner and could see how much pain they were causing. So they felt a connection with the learner, again, increasing that social identity. When you decrease that social connection between the teacher and the experimenter, that increases the likelihood that they will be disobedient. So if the experimenter is absent and is giving instructions over the phone, far more participants were disobedient. And if there were multiple teachers, um, so multiple um, people who were um, supposed to be giving electric shocks, but two of those teachers were confederates, so we still only had one participant. If the two other confederates rebelled, then the participant tended to rebel as well. Very few people obeyed authority when they had the social support to disobey authority. So, who can explain Adolf Eichmann better? Milgram, who thinks that he's just like any man and was just following orders, or Tashful and Turner, who thought that maybe that he identified quite strongly with the Nazis and actually quite identified with the Nazi movement, so he probably wanted to do the horrible things he was doing. Ultimately, it was a myth that he was unthinkingly following orders.
Bye, guys.